It's a beautiful day. Amen. I'm glad that you're all here because today we're going to explore Psalm 121. A psalm that may be very dear to you. A psalm that would have helped you withstand struggles. Psalm that the Lord may have reminded you many times over. But we're going to look at it and hopefully we will pick up something new that would again renew us, transform us, revive us. The title that I've chosen today is Truth and Tradition. I'm going to quickly read Psalm 121. Follow with me if you have your Bibles electronically or the Bible you can pick up from the pew. It's a short psalm, so if you can follow with me, that'll be great. Psalm 121, a song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. It was read from the NIV. You probably would have NLT or ESV. The word would be keeper. This psalm belongs to a group of psalms called the Songs of Ascents. This is the first psalm in the series. The first psalm in the series is Psalm 120. And there are a total of 15 psalms. So Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. These psalms have also been called Psalms of Degrees, in keeping with the Hebrew title, which means to ascend or to mount upwards. Some commentators think it is the elevation of voice in music. Others have thought that it represents the 15 steps to go to the temple the, uh, from the, uh, up from the court of the woman to the court of Israelites. And some think, some commentators think that uh, these were sung while climbing the temple mountain. It could also be seen as songs of pilgrims on the way to Jerusalem, God's holy temple. Hence, we could look at this or these collection of psalms as pilgrims psalms or journey psalms. Okay. In order to fully appreciate Psalm 121, I would encourage you to Go home and read Psalm 120 and Psalm 122. The two Psalms adjacent to Psalm 121. 120 and 122. However, I will touch upon it briefly here so that we can get an orientation. They speak of a journey or a pilgrimage. Psalm 120 speaks about our struggles with fear. Lies and darkness that surrounds and overwhelms us. Hence the psalmist focus on the individual. He says, I am in distress. Save me. I live among. I lived among. I am. When you go home, you will notice that. And please, I would encourage you to read it to appreciate Psalm 121 better. Psalm 122 speaks about the pilgrim's arrival at the final destination, which is Jerusalem, the holy city. Hence, the psalmist records, our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. So the pilgrimage, journey psalm, the song of ascents, however you want to see it, but it's a pilgrim's journey. Pilgrim, you and I. In those days, the Israelites. They were having struggles. Psalm 120. But they moved along. They reached their final destination, Psalm 122, the gates of Jerusalem, the city of God. In the middle of these two Psalms is Psalm 121. In the midst of our sorrows and struggles, the psalmist asks, verse 1, who can be turned to? Who will help me? In the midst of these sorrows, in the midst of the struggle, in our journey to the destination, who will help me? Who do I turn to? Verse 2. My help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. You can immediately realize 
and appreciate the hope that does not come from the creation, the hills, the, the, the mountains or the heaven and the earth, but from the creator of the hills, heaven and the earth. As you can read in Psalm 121, 1 and 2. The psalmist says, who do I turn to? Where does my hope come from? My hope comes from Yahweh. My hope does not come from creation, but my hope comes from the creator. That distinction we need to appreciate. In Psalm 33, verse 16 to 22, it reads, No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our shield. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, as we put our hope in you. Here we can clearly see the size of the army, the strength of the army, the horses, created things, does not give us hope. But the creator, God, Yahweh, is the one who gives us hope. Let us take a moment to think about situation or situations in our life that is really weighing us down. And what are we doing about it? On what or who are we choosing to put our hope? Now don't tell me we don't have struggles. And don't let anyone else tell you that as Christians we shouldn't have struggles. But my question to us is, where are we putting our hope? On created things? On our own ability? On people? On the strength of the clout that we have? Strength of our influences? Strength of our money? Strength of our credentials? Or humbly, Yahweh, my God, I turn to you and you alone. Because the Creator is more powerful than the creations. Let us take this time to acknowledge problems you are having. Confess and ask for forgiveness if we have put our hope elsewhere. And proclaim with our mouth that henceforth we are going to fully put our hope in God, the maker of heaven and earth. I have struggles. Our family has struggles. But every day we have to make it a point intentionally to decide, Lord, I am so, so tempted to do it my way. If I had my way, this is how I would do it. Because I can. But Lord, I give myself to you because you are creator, my creator. And I choose, we choose to put our hope in you. So think about it. What is it that we are struggling with? And we are fighting this to do it our way. But the challenge for us today is, can we let go and let the Creator, Yahweh, be our hope? I have a short prayer here. I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at it, and I'm going to read it out loud. A prayer to acknowledge first that we have struggles, and also a confession that, Lord, I have turned away from you and tried to deal with that problem myself. Looking at friends and, you know, finances. Things that I can do. And it's not becoming successful. I'm a failure. It's like going against the wind. I'm struggling. I confess, Lord. And then proclaim today right here and see what the Lord can do in our lives. So I'm going to read this prayer. If you want to pray it out quietly, please do. 
those of you who would like to raise your voice and say it well within the limitations of the the people next to you please do so as well god my father i acknowledge that i am having this struggle this problem you can name the problem i confess that i have put my hope elsewhere please forgive me from now on i proclaim that i am going to fully put my hope in you for i know that my help comes from the lord the maker of heaven and earth amen now if you're thinking bobby you know what this is not a convenient spot for me to do that or say that prayer don't worry about it i have a handout for you at the end of the service please collect it rachel will be there handing it out in addition to the other points from this sermon today so you can take it home and have a discussion with your family with your children and that will introduce them to what we are talking about today well the psalm does not end there neither does my sermon are you ready to explore a bit more okay in verses 3 to 8 the psalm is begins to build on the hope that was introduced in verse 2 in verses 3 to 8 so verse 1 and 2 we looked at that and in verses 3 to 8 8 is the final verse the psalm is begins to explore the hope that was built or injected so to speak this consists of the reiteration of a word or clause that is occurring in one verse which is used in the next verse as a step or degree by which to ascend to another and higher truth for example and you will see this characteristic in this psalm along with other psalms as well but we're focusing on this psalm today he who watches does not slumber he who watches does not slumber or sleep so there is an addition there's a higher degree of truth does not slumber doze off or sleep for a long time the higher degree of truth next 7 and 8 the lord watches over your life a higher degree of truth watches over your coming and going the highest degree of truth now and forevermore oh hallelujah as you put your hope in the lord we begin to experience higher degrees of truth higher steps of truth am i right don't you think so as you walk the pilgrim's walk you come to understand your god a bit more god is your savior true but he is much more than your savior so we can see that characterized in this psalm higher degrees of truth be re- being revealed the hope that is being injected is being built upon in understanding the degrees of truth that is introduced in this psalm the key word in verses 3 to 8 is keeper or watchman god is not only the creator of heaven and earth but the watchman or keeper of israel or in other words those who are his when we put our hope in god through jesus christ his son we come under his protection he is our keeper he is our watchman this does not mean that we will face no troubles or nothing ill will happen to us on the contrary the greater truth is that even if it does as we continue to put our hope in god we will not be separated from god he will be with us both now and forevermore apostle paul in romans 8:38 39 it was read here already says for i am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of god that is in christ jesus our lord you know why because he is our creator creation and the impact of creation cannot separate us from the creator because we are his and he is our keeper it's a powerful truth it's a powerful truth 
As we learn to put our hope in God, we come to understand more and more of who he is and what his plan and purposes are for our lives. We will come to realize that there are ever increasing degrees of truths that unfolds when we put our hope in God. What has been a truth or some truths that has become clearer to you when you put your hope in God? Ask yourself that question. Most of us here have put our hope in God. But the question I have for us is, what has been some degrees of truths, some steps of understanding the hope that we have in God that has become clearer to you because you put your hope in God? I'd like to invite Rachel, my wife, to share her point of view on this and how she has come to understand some truths as she has learned to put her hope in God. Those of you who know me well know that I'm not a stage person. I like working behind the scenes. But when Bobby asked me to share something, I have learned, I prayed and thought of sharing this from a journal entry I had written when our life circumstances were not going according to my plans. Reminded of Mary and her pregnancy, you would think as the lady chosen to conceive and deliver, the savior of the world, she would have a blissful pregnancy, or God would make it possible for her to have a blissful pregnancy. Instead, she had no family support, financial support, was taunted and shunned, and had to travel a long journey before the baby was due and finally gave birth in a cow shed. To save their son's life, they had to still make sudden journeys to lonely places. Yet all the suffering was nothing compared to seeing her son being different than what she expected in ministry, not the reigning king, and his gruesome death on a criminal's cross. What a blow to a person who surrendered and said, I am your handmaid, let it be done to me as your will. How distorted is my view on God's protection, guidance, and provision? The promise to a Christian is therefore not one of a blissful existence, peaceful circumstances, and a no suffering guarantee, but the promise of his presence, providence, protection, and provision in the midst of all circumstances and situations. So this led me to discuss with my son, because he is a believer in Christ too. So I asked him, he's a teenager. Teenagers are sometimes the ones who struggles because they are introduced to life and life and the struggles that comes along with it. So I asked my son, because it's a good point of discussion, hence I have prepared the handouts so that you can take it back to your families and probably introduce it to your children, grandchildren. So I asked him, Nathan, what do you think is a truth that you have come to understand because you have learned to put your trust in God, your hope in God? He said, Dad, I study well. I try my best to get good grades. But sometimes pride creeps in. And God reminds me, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How he teaches me is, when I go to write exams, fully confident, I would use the word overconfident. This is a cakewalk. I can do it. I don't get the marks that I expect. I lose marks for silly mistakes. God is teaching me a lesson, correcting me to put my hope in God. Yesterday he went for a theory exam for music and my son prayed a very good prayer. Lord, I put my confidence in you. I prepare my horses for battle, but the victory is yours. And he comes back and tells me, when I had the discussion with him in relation to this, he said, when I prayed that prayer, I knew the Lord is my keeper. The Lord would guide me. And as a matter of fact, I had finished the exam in one hour's time. 
Rather than walk away from the hall, I decided to stay back and sit there and review it again. I found seven mistakes. I'm not sure why it was, but I felt led to those areas to look at it again. I thought I had completed everything. I was going to hand it in and leave. So what does that mean to us? For a teenager and for an adult, trust in God. The victory is His. Hope in God. And then He will lead you to greater truths about Him. For my son, it was understanding, putting his hope in God, that the reward is from the Lord. He will bless the work of his hands. That's the son's, my son's understanding of that truth. A higher degree of truth. God is your helper. For my wife, in her case, it was God provides in ways that we don't think about. Our plans are different and God's plans are different. But he is our keeper. He is our provider. He will bring to pass what he thinks is the best for us. Just as there are degrees of truths, there are also degrees of traditions. Just there are degrees of truth, there are degrees of traditions. That corrupts or distorts the truths. By traditions, I mean certain practices or teachings that may have started as one person's conviction, but now introduced as truth for others to follow. We need to be ever vigilant and root out such traditions and teachings with the biblical truth. Where there are degrees of truths, there are also degrees of traditions that can creep in. And the church, especially these days, we have to be watchful. I'm going to pick up two examples, as you can see on the slide there. Mark 7, 1 to 23, and Matthew 15, 1 to 20. In a, inner cleanliness versus outer cleanliness. The disciples did not wash their hands. The Pharisees introduced a teaching which is outer cleanliness is more important and hand washing is more important. Jesus corrected that teaching, said inner cleanliness is what is important. That was a tradition that was introduced. Same with 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, 15. The fact of the Lord's return was there amongst the people. So a group of people began to teach. You don't need to work. Just lay around and wait around for the Lord's return. The truth is the Lord is coming back. But the tradition that crept in the teaching just lays around. Wait for his coming. Paul had to correct that teaching. Because that was distorting the truth. Paul had to be a watchman or keeper of the flock to correct such wrong teachings. Jesus had to do it too. From taking root in the midst of the church. Similarly, we have to be watchful and vigilant of such teachings and traditions from entering our lives, families and churches. How do we distinguish truth and man-made traditions or teachings that masquerades as truth. How do we distinguish? Because sometimes it's so, so subtle. The tradition looks like a truth. How do we distinguish? Truth transforms the heart. Or truth touches the heart. I like the word transforms. Truth transforms the heart. Tradition fills the head. That's what happened to the Pharisees. Their head was filled, but their heart was unclean. Second, truth sets you free, but tradition binds you. So what happened with the Pharisees is they bound the disciples. The disciples were bound. Their disciples. Unless you wash, you cannot be clean. Truth convicts you. Tradition condemns you. That would be the litmus test for us. Ask yourself the question when a teaching comes to you, is it a tradition or is it a truth? Does it transform me? Does it fill my head? Does it set me free or does it bind you? Does it convict you or does it condemn you? 
A classic example which my son pointed out to me is the stoning of the prostitute brought to Jesus. The Pharisees wanted to stone her. Jesus said, I have found no sin in you. And he expresses a greater truth. Go and sin no more. Powerful. That's a truth that transformed her heart, set her free, and convicted her. Pharisees had tradition that filled their heads. They wanted to stone her. They wanted to bind her. And that bound her and condemned her. Am I making sense? What are some of the teachings or traditions that have crept in to corrupt or distort the truth? Ask yourself the question. What are some of the teachings or traditions that have crept in to corrupt or distort the truth of God? I'll give you one example. There was a preacher, this was a few years ago, who went around saying, he's a preacher, he preaches from the word, who went around saying that children of God do not have accidental deaths. I'm going to repeat myself again. He went around teaching and preaching that children of God do not have accidental deaths. He apparently stated this as a truth till the day he died in a terrible accident. Was that a truth or was that a tradition? Apply the test. It filled the head. Right? It did not set people free and it condemned. Imagine that message going to the crowd of people sitting and there is the loved one of a person who has died who the person knows has been in faith for many years but in a devastating car accident. That person walks away thinking, my loved one is not a Christian. We have to be ever watchful. Think about it. Are there any traditions that has crept in? So, to wrap it up, Psalm 121 is a beautiful psalm with ever increasing degrees of truths that will help us put our hope in God as our creator and our keeper, both now and forevermore. So what does the table tell us? It wraps it up for you, for us, neatly. Here you go, Psalm 120. The struggles that we face, the pains and the anguish we face. We are pilgrims. We are pilgrims. Psalm 121, the hope. What is the hope? God is our keeper. He keeps us. Just as the Israelites sang the song and went, Psalm 122, they reached the city of Jerusalem. As we go through our struggles, filled with the hope, our God keeper and creator and keeper would reveal higher degrees of truth. He will keep us till we reach our heavenly abode. Amen. There is a handout, like I said, with the questions and the prayer we prayed. As discussion starters, this could be used for discussion with your family, with your loved ones. I also think with children, especially the ones who are able to know right from wrong. Not the little ones, please. Particularly teenagers, I feel, who are being introduced into the struggles of life. It will be a good discussion starter. I hope you'll be blessed by it. God bless you.